Ladies and gentlemen, people of the internet, welcome back to yet another episode of Crypto Over Coffee. I hope you're doing well today. And if you're new here, every Saturday, we break down the latest news and the hottest topics in the world of technology and cryptocurrency over a cup of delicious coffee. Now, that being said, in today's episode, I'm talking about Cardano, a crypto market update, Kusama, an extra thick 404 logic not found segment and more so make sure you stick around for the entire episode to get all the updates and as always let's kick it off with questions from you the folks who support crypto over coffee thank you so much for that and if you want one of your questions answered please leave them in the comments down below or tweet me at hashoshi4 and if you'd be so inclined please do subscribe to the channel, hit the bell notification button, or follow the podcast on your platform of choice. It's available everywhere, and you'll get a heads up whenever I post new episodes of Crypto Over Coffee every Saturday. And finally, if you're a Cardano ADA holder, please do consider delegating to my stake pool. The ticker symbol is H4SH, like hash, and I will leave some links in the description below to the pool information. So thanks in advance for that. And let's go ahead and get started with these questions today. Now, the first question of the day is from Mark. I don't wanna give Mark's last name, wanna keep this uh, at least pseudonymous here. So here's the question. With Ethereum, blockchain, the blockchain requires the use of Ether to pay fees in the form of gas, which helps drive demand and produce higher prices for Ether. However, Cardano allows blockchain fees to be paid in native tokens. Does this mean it does not create demand for ADA and therefore help drive demand for the price of ADA? So basically the question is, is it a bad idea to have uh, the ability on the Cardano network to uh, basically pay fees in a non-native currency? And in my opinion, it really is interesting, this question, because ultimately, what you have is this juxtaposition where you have to basically move from ADA at some point in time to a non-native token, like a token that someone else creates. But at the end of the day, underneath it all, there is an ADA denomination to the non-native tokens that you're buying. So the user created tokens that you're buying and that you're using and transacting. I actually think this is kind of nice because it's going to enable uh, dap ecosystems basically that don't have exposure directly to ada so this is a user experience and developer experience feature that i think drove iohk and those who designed cardano and the broader open source ecosystem to do it this way it does make it more difficult though to implement something like you see in eip 1559 with ethereum where you're basically burning gas the fee which is just really denominated in ether small fractions of ether and ultimately, that lets you then instantly essentially burn supply from, you know, from the, the total supply of Ether. And that's how you get this like deflationary Ether supply. The difference here is, is that this, I have a feeling, is intentional, right? This isn't a good or a bad thing per se. You look at it from multiple different perspectives. I actually think being able to pay fees in the token that's native to the application you're using is actually kind of more user friendly, though it does not resemble true money in the same way because you don't have this sort of standard um, currency that you have to use. I actually like there's an option. So I don't think this is a bad thing. I think that this is a, a calculated design decision that's just different from Ethereum and not necessarily better or worse. So thank you so much for your question, Mark. Second question of the day is from Baghira. In the next 10 years, if we fully adopted digital currency worldwide, would that improve our situation or make things worse, even, it's, even if it's just by the slightest bit? So this is a multifaceted question. And I think this is derivative of a conversation about um, you know, climate change and cryptocurrency and how crypto networks work in general. So here's my thoughts. There's a lot of talk about central bank digital currencies and digital currencies being used at the highest levels, right? Being used at the, you know, at your country level, internationally, et cetera. My thought is this, and, I, and I've expressed my thoughts on, on these sort of like CBDC or central bank digital currency projects before. I'm all for a CBDC if and only if constituents or residents of countries that they belong in are actually involved in the governance of that system, using the decentralized nature of that 
the core technology in order to let people have more of a hand in the governance of money. I think that should happen. That is why I've supported this technology. However, it doesn't seem that it's actually going to work out that way. So for me, I'm not really in support of just yet another means by which to perform like, I guess, like monetary surveillance, if you will, or to create an, an easier path by which a few people can basically box out anyone they want from the financial system by flipping a switch. I don't really like that that power would exist. And so simply adopting digital currency to me is not just an instant win. What would be a, a huge win is to have a sort of a family or a group of interconnected decentralized networks that are run by basically borderless communities around the world that you can use to uh, you know, transact with each other, interact with each other, uh, to build these communities. And I think that's what I would support. So really, what I'm trying to say here is, there's an opportunity to improve our situation globally. And of course, improvement is subjective. What I think is an improvement might not be what you think, and that's totally okay. But ultimately, I think we just have to be careful about what we define as a victory in this particular conversation. So that's all I'll say on the matter. But thank you for your question. And finally, there's a question here from someone, let's just call him D, because this is a unique name. I don't want to, to, to dox this person. I have an Ellie Pal tal, uh, Titan wallet, excuse me. Let's say the company goes out of business, they shut down or whatever, and the Ellie Pal app is not accessible any longer. How can I access my crypto then? So my answer to this question and the reason I picked it as a question for today is because this is relevant for a lot of people, not just this person here. What I would say is, in this case, if the Ellie Pal Titan no longer works because the app is out of business, right, then you actually have a great, uh, great thing at your disposal because these hardware wallets almost all use the uh, BIP or BIP39 or BIP44 standard or both, which are basically these formalized standards for, for wallet wallet structure, let's just put it that way, for key derivation from a, a root or seed key. And so as long as you've written down that 12 or 24 word seed phrase correctly, and you've verified it, which you should be doing no matter what wallet you have, making sure that it's written down properly and verifying it directly with the wallet, only on the hardware, not on the app. Please do not use app, app verification of your seed. But if you have that, then if that app for your Ellie Pal Titan or your hardware stops working, you can easily move that wallet and all the wallets therein from that EliPal over to another supported hardware that supports that same BIP39 or BIP44 standard, right? So that's the benefit of having a seed phrase. That's why keeping your seed phrase safe is the most important part of having a crypto wallet because it lets you have that freedom. If your hardware fails, something else happens, you can't access something, you can basically just uh, recover your wallets to another uh, supported wallet. So it's, it's pretty much that simple. And that's why you can have that peace of mind that you don't have to worry so much in the case of hardware failure or a company going out of business. So thank you so much for your questions, folks. Let's go ahead and dive into the news section because we've got a lot of stuff to talk about. As a friendly reminder, please be aware of scammers in the comments that are posing as me and other crypto YouTubers. I do not have a WhatsApp. I will not ask you to contact me. There's pretty much, that's pretty much it. If the comment doesn't have the name highlighted like you see here, it isn't me and you can report them. So please be safe out there. And before we get started with the crypto market update, coffee break. Today, Mudhouse Coffee Roaster, Charlottesville, Virginia. Well, folks, another week and another tumultuous but mostly sideways market pattern filled with the usual push and pull of good and bad news. We closed the week on Friday at around 37,000 Bitcoin. And as my head hit the pillow last night, we had retraced to 36,000 and then 35,000 by the time I'm sitting here with you coffee in hand to talk about it market moves fast. However, I have to say this really does feel like a perfect storm, but a storm that we can weather together. That rhymes totally unintentionally weather together, but it has a ring to it anyways. With respect to this crypto market update, I want to focus on two things. First, the FUD or fear, uncertainty and doubt that we've seen over the last couple months has ended up being total nonsense more often than not. For example, the India crypto ban. That news turned out to be total hogwash. It was just not factual. And guess what? There are now 
reports that India has flipped totally and is considering making Bitcoin a formal asset class in the country. It sounds a bit crazy to me that something like that flipped so fast from polar sides of the script, right? My point here is that a lot of what's pulling down the market is market exhaustion from months of bullish fervor. It's manipulative FUD, stories like this that don't really have any value, and just general overreaction in the markets to news that is just not worthy of panic. Now, the second thing I want to note is that this time right now that we're in, to me, feels so different from what 2018's bear market fall off felt like. And I maintain that we may not see the short term resurgence that everyone wants, but we will go back to positive price movement on the back of renewed demand and excitement again this year. In my opinion, it's a guess, not a promise. I mean, look at the good news. We just saw the long awaited taproot upgrade on Bitcoin get locked in on the network, which brings more efficient signatures, better support for privacy and complex multi-sigs and conditional transactions. It shows that Bitcoin's still getting upgraded. This is great. Progress is being made. Same thing happens for other projects as well, deploying and delivering new features. Just remember, have a plan, take profit where you can, harvest losses where you can, and be really cognizant of risk management during the turbulence, and you will be okay. Now, I've been hearing a lot about Cardano ADA on Twitter and how irritated people are about the price action lately. There's a worry that ADA is going into a bear market as it sits under a buck 50 right now. I would like to point out to you, though, that ADA has been on an insane run over the last several months. And if you look to history, every time there's been a big feature launch or a hard fork in the Cardano world, the run up to that launch, the hype is, is just wrought with price discovery on the top end, like new all time highs. And then when the launch nears or when the launch happens, it takes a dive because the market basically is falling off of that hype. And then the new features eventually level things out and then you start to grow again. The point here is that I get why you might feel frustrated by the price action right now. But Cardano's really outperformed the market over the last, you know, the, the rough period over the last several months. So just hang on tight for Gogan to launch and bring smart contracts and things will stabilize. Prices can't go up forever without retracement. Remember that. However, look at the successes that are mounting here. Like, look at them objectively. The first ever smart contract was executed on testnet this week. That's huge. Stake pole operators are making 100% of the blocks on the network. Also great. And there's a huge mountain of decentralized applications. Startups already ready to build and launch on mainnet exactly when it comes. The future is bright, in my opinion. So don't sweat the short-term moves. It's early days for Cardano right now. It still is really early days. And speaking of that, if you have a Cardano-focused decentralized application team you want me to interview on the channel, please comment the name below and I will reach out and try and get that done for you. I'm trying to find some to bring on the channel. And finally, if you are a Cardano fan and an ADA holder, please do consider delegating to my new Cardano stake pool with the ticker H4SH. I will leave the details below if you need the pool ID, for example, but I'm working hard to grow this and get it minting blocks to pay rewards to you. So thank you in advance for that. Next up is a topic I've been waiting to cover for a while, and it is finally here. Now, if you watched my altcoin picks video series uh, that I made heading into 2021, I think I released it in the fall or the summer of last year, you'd remember that one of my big picks was Kusama, the K Canary Network, if you will, for Polkadot. And essentially, Kusama is a battleground for early launch of Polkadot's latest features and developments. You basically get Polkadot, but faster on Kusama. Kusama has a fantastic community and is by design getting everything that makes Polkadot such a powerhouse ahead of the actual Polkadot launch itself. Kusama is no testnet though. It's a real thriving ecosystem that will exist well into the future past Polkadot's launch in its own right. Now by that hand, Kusama has the same parachain slot mechanism that Polkadot's design has outlined, where KSM, the native coin on Kusama, is bonded by parachains to earn a slot in the larger interoperability network. Parachains are basically sovereign blockchains that have unique features and functionality that want to join this interoperable multi-chain network that is Kusama. Now coming this week, this coming week, the long-awaited parachain auctions where the future parachain slot holders will actually win a lease spot in the network for users to engage with, with live is happening. So this is a huge milestone for both Kusama and its sibling Polkadot because it will finally show the culmination of years of work to get a functioning multi-chain ecosystem live on mainnet. So this auction is the start of the future of crypto, in my opinion. The cost to win a slot will not be cheap though, because it's estimated that it will require about 
15 to 20 million dollars worth of KSM or DOT to win a slot, man, I'm rhyming like crazy today, DOT to win a slot in the network during the auction. However, networks that do win a slot in the auction will be able to be the first live blockchains in the brave new world of interoperability on Kusama. And, and likely that will drive a ton of interest from users as a result and growth for those projects. So exciting times, going to be following that. Now, it's been a while also since I covered something Chainlink specific, but there's something I just couldn't let go without mentioning here. Chainlink just launched an open beta for a new product that they call Chainlink Keepers, which is a super powerful tool for decentralized application developers to solve for one other big gotcha in the smart contract operation space. And that is the fact that smart contracts are by default asleep. They're basically dependent on external triggers to execute pieces of code, including maintenance code. In the world of DeFi, for example, smart contract functions might be written to execute liquidations of under collateralized loans to mitigate liquidity risk. Today, you might write a custom service to watch on chain loan collateralization and then call a liquidation function when you hit a certain threshold. This was something that you would build manually for each project. But with the Chainlink Keepers, there is now a scalable and standard tool with decentralization at its core to manage your event-driven or scheduled smart contract executions. This is done through a set of decentralized keepers, hence the name, which are basically agents that execute an action based on your desired trigger. This gives you the assurance that your desired action will happen in a timely manner. Now, as a developer, you can go into the tool, set a time-based trigger like a scheduled date time or an event based trigger like uh, if this happens, then do that kind of like what I was talking about before in DeFi. So this tool is going to be used heavily. I'm almost certain of it, particularly in DeFi where scheduled and event based actions are pretty much always necessary. So big shout out to the Chainlink team for augmenting their Oracle offering, which is already impressive with this awesome component, just making smart contracts even more valuable and even more powerful. Now, next up, folks, is today's game of fact or FUD, where I take a piece of no good, very bad news and tell you whether it is fact or simply fear, uncertainty, and doubt. Now, today, my friends, we are cons like considering or contending with the news that shook the crypto markets like an earthquake this week, which came in the aftermath of the Colonial Pipeline ransomware attack, which saw hackers make away with a fat stack of Bitcoin. The FBI managed to recover a significant amount of that Bitcoin, and it began to be reported shortly thereafter that the FBI had cracked the cryptography behind Bitcoin wallets, and that they could effectively get access to any wallet anywhere in the world. The stories were literally running that no Bitcoin wallet is safe. That would have, of course, meant there is a quantum computer capable of reverse engineering a 256-bit private key from its public key, but hey, we can all dream, can't we? The other breaking news was that Bitcoin is in fact traceable and not private. Well, insofar that it is an immutable public ledger with pseudonymous on-chain identities, yes, it is traceable and has never been fully anonymous. Naturally, people panicked about this, thinking Bitcoin had been unraveled and cracked completely. And oh no, Bitcoin is not anonymous. Let me put your mind at ease here, folks. Unless there is in fact some alien quantum computer capable of eroding the very bedrock of modern cryptography around the world that we just don't know about, there is nothing to fear here. Reportedly, what really happened is that the FBI supposedly tracked down some of the Bitcoin to a wallet hosted on a server somewhere, which was evidently very poorly secured. So they're able to subpoena to get access to that server, I, I would assume, and then they're able to take control of and manually access that Bitcoin wallet that is stored there to retrieve funds. Once you get onto that server, you find the wallet. If you're just trying to crack a password, it's possible, right? So you're not exactly cracking Bitcoin, but yeah, they got funds back. As you might've guessed, this is a big steamy FUD sandwich, folks. There is no doom and gloom here. Your Bitcoin private key is not at risk of being cracked, okay? Let's just put that to rest. Okay, folks, 404 Logic Not Found is up next, but I wanted to pause really quickly and give a big shout out to the sponsor of Crypto Over Coffee, Ledin. Ledin is a one-stop shop for holders of Bitcoin to earn yield on that Bitcoin and access a plethora of awesome features to grow their stack. You can earn 6.1% interest on Bitcoin and 11% interest on USDC stablecoins, and the features are going to keep on coming. Ledin just raised a $30 million Series A funding round, which will help them further achieve their mission of unlocking the power of the fastest growing asset class for people around the world. So if you haven't already, 
please do uh, try Leaden out or at least just check them out. I'll leave the referral link to the service down below in the description and the pin comment. So thank you in advance. And of course, a big thank you to Leaden for helping me keep the lights on for this show. Now, ladies and gentlemen, it is time for 404logic.found. And for those of you who are as of yet uninitiated in this little firecracker of a segment, I highlight notable tech-related fails or otherwise stupid moves in the world that need to get some attention. Well, speaking of attention, if you want to help this episode of Crypto Over Coffee get some attention from the robots that control the algorithms out there in the social media world, please do hit that like button, get subscribed, or follow the podcast because it tells the robots that run the show here that you might be enjoying this content and others might also enjoy it because of that. So thank you for that in advance. Really, really appreciate it. Now, yet again, there is so much pure, unadulterated nonsense floating around this week that I have no choice but to throw down a thick 404 Logic Not Found doubleheader here. Yes, two today, folks. Get excited. <laughs> First on the Logic Not Found main stage is the general cultish myopia that was on display at Bitcoin 2021, the Miami Bitcoin conference that was subject to much fanfare over the last week. Now, I will preface this by saying that I was not able to attend the event in person and instead watched it on streams, and I heard from many at the event that the audience community was largely kind and respectful, and it was a good time overall. I'm not trying to say the whole event or its organizers or attendees are bad, but there were some issues that are the focus of this segment. We've talked about the distinction between measured and fact-based maximalism, where you just believe something is the best. And then the toxic, crusading, and downright hypocritical form of maximalism that comes from many communities in the crypto space, including the Bitcoin community. Now, one type of maximalism that we just talked about is perfectly reasonable and a state of mind that each person is entitled to in their own right. Freedom to believe vehemently in what you want to believe, right? I disagree with, on principle, the fact that Bitcoin is the only thing on earth that's valuable, but we can each disagree and be free to do so as fellow human beings. But see, it crosses the line when one takes their own beliefs about the superiority of something they hold dear, Bitcoin in this instance, and use it as a weapon to discredit, disparage, and attempt to vilify anyone who does not share their views, particularly for a group of people who preaches about freedom and the importance of freedom in society, a group who lights Twitter ablaze in anger about censorship on the platform and elsewhere. It's markedly illogical to then in the next breath attempt to draw a line in the sand that Bitcoin is freedom and anyone not on board is effectively not going to make it, and then to not so subtly cancel those who partake in shitcoiner activity. The most atrocious commentary at this conference, and there was a lot of cringeworthy stuff at this conference, folks, was one particular sentence, I guess a couple sentences, on a panel that I had to actually rewatch multiple times to be sure that I heard it correctly, because I was so aghast that it was even said. It went something like this. Not only do I think Bitcoin toxicity is important, I think it's absolutely necessary. If you're against Bitcoin toxicity, you're against Bitcoin. And if you're against Bitcoin, you're against freedom. Let me just, just pause there for a second. Let that sink in. I mean, I have what some would call an insane percentage of my net worth in Bitcoin. And I still think this is arguably one of the most ridiculous things I've ever heard in my life. Bitcoin is surely not freedom if it comes with a bunch of big mouth gatekeepers who decide what is and isn't good or valuable. Being a toxic jerk to other people on the basis of the incongruence between your beliefs and theirs is not freedom. That is prison, folks. That is the furthest thing from freedom. If you cannot have a fact-based debate about the merits of Bitcoin and why you choose to only hold Bitcoin without resorting to toxic rhetoric or personal attacks, it just makes me question how rooted and true you are in your convictions. And I know that folks are going to say, well, aren't you doing the same thing right now? I'm not personally attacking this person. I'm saying that it's this, this thought cannot be left alone. Can you see the paradox in saying that Bitcoin is freedom and that anyone against Bitcoin is an enemy to freedom? If Bitcoin is freedom, then wouldn't you support everyone else believing what they want to believe? It just doesn't seem like it. So let me make this abundantly clear. I've devoted the last 10 years of my life to learning about Bitcoin. I've shared that knowledge publicly for the last four years here with you, despite my kind of natural inclination to introversion. 
I will hold Bitcoin till my last breath, but I will never support treating other people with the disrespect that comes with claiming that my beliefs are superior to theirs and that you're against freedom if you don't believe in my beliefs. We all get frustrated. We all want people to see things our way. And I'm guilty of this too. We all are. We're human beings at the end of the day. But we all have to try to understand that everyone sees things differently. Bitcoin is freedom. And that freedom extends equally to those who do not support it as it does to those who do. However you slice it, treating others in a toxic manner over your vehemence about the superiority of an open decentralized store of value protocol is a 404 logic not found. All right, folks, are you feeling the juices flowing? Because I'm kind of amped here. Take a sip of coffee with me. And let's just take a deep breath and get ready for part two. I'm almost done with my coffee. Shout out to all those who say I never finish it. Oh, yeah, we're addressing the woefully misinformed take on Bitcoin and cryptocurrency by Senator Elizabeth Warren. In this, she basically called for crackdowns on the, the climate change disaster that is Bitcoin. The implication is that Bitcoin is a calamity for the environment. It uses, quote, useless, complicated math problems for no good reason. Now, I can forgive the fact that she feels this way because we've, we've talked about the oft one-sided articles that are printed about Bitcoin and crypto in general for being terrible for the environment, basically without counterpoint. However, I've been driven to the brink of insanity by these seemingly poorly researched claims, but more so because their basis is illogical. Senator Warren used these borrowed talking points to try to get a win for climate change, implying that killing Bitcoin would move the needle on climate change. I take issue with that. There's this obsession with reducing consumption of energy. It's drilled into your head as a kid. Hey, turn off the lights, son. You're wasting money and energy. I'm a person who used to cry as a kid when I saw trees being mowed down by the thousands to make retail locations all around my hometown. I'm all for conservation and protecting our earth. But the way that we go about problems as humans, to me, at times, is very backwards. We seem to prioritize band-aid solutions rather than long-term solutions. Where we have seemed to fail is focusing on the wrong side of the graph here. So you've got this graph, you've got demand, which is the demand for energy around the world. And you've got the supply, which is the total supply of energy we create from all sources. Demand is pretty predictable because as people are born, more of the world industrializes, more and more of the world becomes te technologically driven. As this happens, which will not stop, the demand growth will continue on a starkly positively sloped trend line. That means it's going up. Supply, however, is pesky because there's a limited supply of polluting dead dinosaurs and trapped gas on Earth, but there's a theoretically unlimited supply of energy from the movement of our tide, the shifting of our winds, the molten heat of Earth's core, and the great big nuclear reactor in the sky, the sun. All we have to do is invest, invent, and adopt technology that allows us to capture, store, and distribute that clean energy to send the supply side of our graph to a trajectory that will readily cover the demand of humanity's unrelenting growth, more, adequ more than adequately cover it. It will far outstrip it. See, we are a highly evolved species, but in my opinion, we fixate on the wrong side of a problem quite a lot. Right now, the fixation is to stomp down demand for energy, going against the immovable, unstoppable tide of humanity, which will only seek to use more energy forever. It will not work. I'm all for cutting down waste and creating efficient machines to use less energy. Yes, that is important. But I mean, we live in a culture that pats our collective selves on the back for shutting off our lights and TVs for one measly day on Earth Day just to then go on with our normal lives as if nothing happened. The real solution, of course, is logically to create a near unlimited supply of energy that is non-polluting and can scale with the demand growth of humanity and then continue to make the resources that consume that energy more efficient at using it. Ironically, these pieces of technology exist already in varying stages of maturity. All they need is to be pursued with the same fervor as people seem to pursue half-baked attempts to reduce energy consumption in places that simply will not be enough. 
So before we go around foolishly trying to pull Bitcoin down or cryptocurrency down as a quick win for climate change, let's consider the, what problem we're actually solving here. Bitcoin's energy usage and the cost that comes with it is critical to its security and issuance, much like any other store of value on Earth. Gold mining and refining, for example, or the issuance of fiat currency across history follow this same pattern if you peel back the layers. There's lots of costs, lots of waste, and lots of effort. My point here is that Warren is entitled to her opinion, Senator Warren, my apologies, but heck, let's please focus on the right side of the equation to really solve for climate change. Despite my disagreement with Senator Warren's evaluation of Bitcoin itself as a useless computation, I will realize that it's unlikely that she will warm to the idea of a borderless store of value. However, to claim that authoritatively attempting to eliminate Bitcoin would move the needle on climate change is a 404 logic not found and a fool's errand, in my humble opinion. Now, folks, that is going to do it for Crypto Over Coffee today. I really hope that you enjoyed the episode. Please let me know what you think in the comments down below. If you have some time to stick around, please do also check out my top three VPN picks video, which will be linked in the description below, as well as on the screen here, which is much easier to click, actually. So that being said, folks, thank you so much for watching this week's episode of Crypto Over Coffee. Thank you very much for all of your support. I hope you and your family have a restful and amazing week and weekend ahead. And until next time, cheers.